So, welcome to everyone. Welcome, welcome, thank you very much. I'm very, very pleased to have this uh, uh, great turnout. Uh, although it's the very beginning of term, um, but clearly there is tremendous appeal in, uh, in, the, uh, in our very distinguished speaker, um, Professor Amir uh, Maizzi uh, from Paris. Uh, one thing you will notice, uh, and this is, I mean, of course, this was one of the uh, one of the matters that impelled me to invite him in the first place, quite apart from his incredible erudition, his massive erudition, is the uh, robustness and forthrightness uh, with which he expresses whatever conclusions uh, he comes to without wishing to, uh, without wishing to uh, please too many people uh, all the time. Um, Professor Moazzi is a, uh, um, an extraordinarily accomplished expert on Shiite Islam. Um, I have personally particularly profited and enjoyed, in fact, enjoyed reading his book, which recently appeared in English translation under the, the title, what do they call it, The Silent Quran and the Speaking Quran, in which he takes up quite a number of themes which he had taken up in a variety of other works before, starting with his book on the Divine Guide in Shiite Islam going through an excellent edition of uh, a, uh, the, the, the book on the, uh, uh, on the Sayyari's book on various Quranic lections, uh, readings. Uh, the question of Quranic readings is extremely important. And this, uh, the physical evidence that we have, or the physical evidence that is suggested about Quranic variations, about histories of composition, um, are matters which present us with an extremely intriguing picture uh, which has not yet been clarified to anyone's satisfaction and which is likely not to be uh, satisfied to everyone's satisfaction over a long period of time. Um, and that is why when uh, Amir Moazi asks the question, why is the Quranic text problematic? Um, it is a question which, is, um, which constitutes, as a matter of fact, a tremendous growth area in scholarship in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendous gross area in scholarship in a field um, in which now we are getting greater access to the material evidence, to the earliest manuscripts, to the earliest palimpsests. And we, of course, have been privileged at this university in having Dr. Alba Fedeli as a post uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, those of you who uh, are apprised of these matters will know that she uh, uh, was successful in dating uh, the earliest attestable uh, Quranic fragment uh, at the University of uh, at the University of Birmingham, and I would be particularly looking forward to um, the way in which Professor Amir Moazi is <coughs> going to use literary evidence, literary evidence, literary in the generic sense of literary evidence, to raise questions concerning the composition of the text, the integrity of the text, and quite a number of other matters which arise in whatever one says about the genesis of whatever text. Texts are, um, I'm afraid to say, worldly material objects, and it is to the worldly material object of the Quranic text that uh, we are going to uh, be considering this evening. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aziz. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> thank you so much to Central European University for this invitation and to my colleagues and friends, Professor Aziz Azmi and Professor Wilke. I'm so glad to you know Alba Fedeli here. And I would like also to thank uh, Mrs. Mr. Holbrook for his perfect sense of organization for my <laughs> invitation and this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> for all those interested in the religious history of the Near and Middle East, during the late antiquity, the advent of Muhammad in Arabia and the beginnings of Islam are exciting fields of research. The present lecture about the problematic nature of the Quran tries to put these subjects into perspective 
the broad <coughs> historical and spiritual context of the 6th and 7th centuries. It is based on a sort of syllogism. Syllogism. Muhammad and his message belong to Jewish, Christian, or Judeo-Christian monotheism, as is heavily attested by the Quran and the Hadith. Muhammad's first message seems to announce the imminent end of the world, as is evident from many Quranic passages and several very early hadiths. So Muhammad cannot but announce the coming of the Messiah as the savior of the end of the world. On this last point, the Quran remains curiously silent. But according to a large number, large number of ancient hadiths, Muhammad actually announces the imminent coming of the Messiah, and the latter is none other Jesus. At the same time, for some followers of Muhammad, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph of the Islam, and the first Imam of the Shiites, Ali seems to have been the second Jesus, Christ and Messiah of the apocalyptic times. After the death of Muhammad and Ali, the non-advent of the end of the world, the triggering and extension of civil wars between Muslims, the Arab establishment of an empire, things will evolve in directions very probably not planned at the beginning. These problems may explain, maybe, the problematic nature of the Quran. The Quranic text is problematic. Anyone who has read it, or even traveled through it, can easily see that this text, for the most part, has no narrative structure. It is desultory, fractured, disjointed. The same story e.g. Moses or Noah's war, is told elusively and then cut into pieces, and its pieces are scattered throughout the corpus. <coughs> this problem very often makes the text difficult to understand. Difficulty that posterior exegesis attempted to solve without always succeeding. The problem is not new. From the first centuries of the Hijra, Muslim scholars tried already to answer the question of Christian and Jewish polemics in the Middle Ages about the form and the content of the Quran, and then the Orientalists from the 19th century to the present day. Just a few indications will show objectively the embarrassment of the Muslims. <coughs> One, for several centuries, there was debate about the authenticity of the official Quran, the Vulgate of Osman who was accused of having been falsified. Among all criticisms, the Shi'i attacks were the most violent and the most coherent. Two, in the face of the criticism of the Christian and Manichaean polemicists who mocked the stylistic disorder of the Quran, the Sunni scholars elaborated a literary gem called Nazm al-Qur'an, the composition of the Quran. The problem is that each author gives different reasons to justify this particular composition of the Quran. This means that they did not know the reason of the fragmentary nature of the Quran. Three, same observation for another literary genre, the Asbab al nuzur the circumstances of the revelation. The aim of this genre is to present the historical circumstances in which this or that part of the Quran was revealed. Again, there is an Surahs have been more or less classified according to their length, from the longest to the beginning of the Quran, in the beginning of the Quran to the briefest toward the end. Why this order? Nobody knows. Moreover, finally, the surahs were divided into Meccan and Medinas. But in the Meccan surahs there are Medinan verses, and the Medinan surahs there are Meccan verses. Why? We don't know. Three great Muslim scholars tried to restore the chronological order of the surahs. Ibn al-Nadim in the 10th century, al-Zarqashi in the 14th century, and al-Suyuti in the 15th century. But we have three different lists of surahs. This means that the real chronological order of the revelations was unknown. This was very probably one of the causes of the stylistic disorder of the Quran. 
All this shows that already for the Muslim scholars, the Quran had many problems to which there were no definitive and precise answers. Five. The Orientalists, for the part, have identified and analyzed the same problems. They have also studied many other problems related to the form and the content of the Quran since the 19th century. Among the questions asked by them, I shall take three questions. The first great Islamologist, <coughs> who were also great Biblist scholars, Belhausen, Nöldeke, and Kozier, have rightly stated that the Quran belonged to the textual tradition of the Old and New Testaments. The Quran itself does not cease to say so. Muhammad appears everywhere as the continuator of Moses and Jesus. Now, the Quran presents two great anomalies in relation to this textual tradition. First, the absence of narrative logic. In the Bible, all the stories are told normally with the beginning, a middle, and an end. In the Quran, where many biblical prophets are mentioned, no history is complete. Then, even this incomplete story is cut into pieces, and the pieces are scattered in different parts of the corpus. Why? Second problem and second anomaly. In the Bible books, when the story of a prophet or a sage is told, his contemporaries are always present, and they play a very important role. His family, his parents, his brothers and sisters, children, friends, faithful, enemies. In the Quran, no contemporary of Muhammad is cited, except for two enigmatic figures that are of no importance historically. Zaid, i.e. the hypothetic adopted son of Muhammad and Abu Lahab, and another hypothetic uncle of Muhammad. <coughs> no mention of the family of the Prophet, his daughter Fatima, very important since the mother of his only male descendants. His descendants, his great friends, his main enemies, nothing. He himself is only quoted four or five times, whereas the biblical prophets and saints, Abraham, Noah, Jonah, David, Solomon, Zechariah, Mary, Mary, Jesus, and so on, are cited hundreds of times. Why? Finally, the third problem raised by the Orientalist, especially Paul Casanova in the beginning of 20th century, the absence of the figure of Messiah in the Quran. <clears throat> the apocalyptic dimension of the Quran is very powerful. I will come back to this in detail. The Messiah or a savior of the end times is extremely present in the Hadith, and yet no mention of the Messiah in the Quran. Jesus is called Messiah, the Messiah, in the Quran. <clears throat> but this title is not, not apocalyptic and only signifies the anointed one who received the divine anointing, mass. Why this gap? In my lecture, I will try to pro propose <coughs> hypothesis on the reasons for these problems present in the Quran and already noted by both the medieval Muslims and the Orientalists. I propose basically two lines of research. The civil wars of the beginnings of Islam and the apocalyptic dimension of Muhammad's message. One, civil wars. I recall some events of the beginnings of Islam reported by all sorts of Islamic and non-Islamic sources. <clears throat> After the Hijra, the last years of the life of the Prophet were punctuated by many battles. Among this, the Battle of Badr in the year 2 of Hijra, 624, the first great victory of, the, of Muhammad over his Meccan opponents of his own tribe of Quraysh seems to have left traces that are difficult to forget by them even after the convention to Islam. After the death of Muhammad, according to some rape traditions, he would have been poisoned. His succession triggered a wave of violence on which I will return later. Under the first caliph, Abu Bakr, there took place the bloody wars of apostasy, by which he prevented the newly converted Arabs from returning to their ancestral religion after the death of the Apostle of Allah. According to most accounts, Abu Bakr died of natural deaths. According to others, he too would have been poisoned. 
the time of the second caliph, Omar ibn al-Khattab, was that of the wars of the great Arab conquest. He was also killed, apparently by a Persian slave. The third caliph, Osman ibn Affan, was carried away by what is conventionally called the first major civil war between Muslims. The short train of the force, Ali, was an interrupted series of civil wars. The great battle of Safin opposed him to Muawiyah, leader of the powerful Umayyads, his always enemies. The battle that followed the camel, Jamal, against Aisha, widow of the Prophet, allied to two of the latter's companions, and preceded that of Nahrawan against his former partisan, the partisans of Ali, who had become his most fierce enemies, the Kharijites. Ali was eventually assassinated by one of them. The reign of Umayyads was a long series of abominable repressions and massacres of their opponents, notably the Alids, people of Ali, who will later be called the Shi'is. The infernal cycle of bloody repression and armed rebellion was thus triggered for a long time. The most significant case is the massacre of al Hussein, the well-beloved grandson of Muhammad and son of Ali and Fatima, as well as almost all of his family, and the orders of the seven Umayyad Caliph Yazid I, only a few decades after the death of the Prophet. The Umayyads themselves will be violently overthrown by a great armed revolution, that of the Abbasids. Under the Caliphate of the latter, the violent repression of the adversaries, especially of the Alids, of all obedience once more, will continue intermittently for several centuries. We forget that the Quran was elaborated at the beginning of this period. During the first century of the Hijrah, and according to the hypothesis that becomes more and more plausible, during the reign of the fifth Umayyad Caliph, Abdul Malik, reigned from 65 to 86 of Hijrah, 685-705. This oversight is more astonishing when we meet the same historical personalities in the narratives concerning the two phenomena, the civil wars and the elaboration of the Quran. Abu Bakr, Omar, Osman, Ali, Abdul Malik, the two anti-Shi'i, anti-Shi'i governors of Umayyad Iraq, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. It is known that during the first three centuries of Islam, several different Quranic codex, claimed by different warring factions, circulated on the lands of Islam, and many people disputed the authenticity of the official Quran, the Osmanic Quran. This official Quran took several centuries to be imposed by force and accepted by everyone, except by a part of, by a part of the Shi'is during the Abbasid Caliphate, at the beginning of the fourth, 10th century. According to ancient Shi'i sources, the official Quran is a censored and falsified version of the true Quran revealed to Muhammad. This original true Quran was three times larger than the official version because it contained many passages <coughs> about Muhammad, his family, that is the family of Ali, the Imam par excellence of the Shi'is, his friends, and his enemies. After his death, the death of Muhammad, these enemies, and in particular the Umayyad clan of the Banu Abd Shams tribe of Quraysh, seized power through a genuine organized coup d'etat by dismissing the only legitimate successor of the Prophet, that is to say Ali, and by violently repressing the Alids. So, one of the first things they did was to remove the compromising Quranic passages for them. The passages praising Ali and his son, the only male progeny, male progeny of the Prophet, and attacking his enemies now in power. The very early Shia works cite much of these Quranic passages that are no longer found in the official Quran. According to them, the removal of the names of those contemporary persons of the Prophet and the suppression or alteration of the passages concerning them completely destroyed the original Quranic text, rendering it almost inintelligible in many places. This is the Shi'i thesis of the falsification of the Quran, Tahrif al-Quran or Tahrif al-Kitab. Two, apocalyptic dimensions of Muhammad's message. The Quranic corpus insists heavily on the imminent end of the world, 
Many verses and surahs are more or less directly dedicated to it. This is particularly the case of a great number of the final surahs, the shorter ones, known for being the oldest ones, whose archaic language and <coughs> literary style are in many cases remarkable. These passages announce the dramatic cosmic changes of the end times, invite incredulous mankind to repent and to purify himself in order not to undergo God's wrath, to follow the straight path in order to be part of the peace and good people to whom salvation is promised. We will stick to a few examples, translation from uh, Arbery, the Quran <coughs> Quran 100, the charges, 11 verses in the name of God, by the snorting charges, by the strikers of fire, by the dawn raiders blazing, a trail of dust, cladding therewith with a host. Surely man is ungrateful to his Lord, and surely he is a witness against that. Surely he is a passionate his, in his love for good things. Knows he not that when that which is in the tongues is very soon overthrown, and that which in the breast is brought are surely on that day the Lord shall be aware of them. Quran 1, 102, Revolver, 8 verses, in the name of God. Gross rivalry diverts you, even till you visit the tombs. No indeed, but very soon you shall know. Again, no indeed, but very soon you shall know. No indeed, did you know with the knowledge of certainty you shall surely see hell? Again, you shall surely see it with the eye of certainty that you shall be questioned that day concerning true bliss. The eminence of the end times is further alluded in to in many Quranic periscopes. It is particularly underlined by the use of the term asa, the hour, in order to designate the coming of that end. The term means moment, instant, hour, very short time. Defined by the article al, asa, as is the case in the Quranic occurrence, which means the end of the world, it also takes on the meaning of expression signifying immediacy, such as immediately, at once, right away. Not equal or the blind and the same man. This is the Quran 40, 58. Not equal or the blind and the same man. Those who believe and do this of righteousness and the wrongdoer, little do you reflect the hour is coming, no doubt of it, but most men do not believe. One can also underline the use of the term azifa for the judgment, alluding to the idea of an event that is on the verge of taking place or that is approaching with great speed, something that occurred suddenly. Quran 40, 18, and warned them against the day of the imminent, Yawm al-Azifa, when Shocking with anguish. The hearts are in the throats, and the evil doers have not one loyal friend, no intercessors to be healed. Then, which of the Lord's bounties dispels to? This is a warning of the warners of old. The imminent is imminent. Azifat al Azifat. Apart from God, none can disclose it. The examples taken from the Quran can thus be multiply, multiplied on many other pages. Those passages, as well as the many similar data and the Hadith corpus, on which I shall come back, have led some scholars from the 19th century to this day to consider the Quran, the milieu that saw it originate, as well as the very first time of Islam, as phenomena belonging to a certain time and space, in other words, to a history and geography, strongly steeped in apocalyptic beliefs. The interrogation set off by those researchers have profoundly renewed the issues, the putting in perspective and the methods of investigation concerning the birth of the Arab religion. If Muhammad had come to announce the end of the world as an important part of the Quran and Hadith proof, why would he found a new religion? To which religious milieu did he belong to? What is the part of the great religions of the time, such as Judaism, Christianity, or Manichaeism? in its formation and message. How should we understand the other non-apocalyptic parts of the two scriptural sources of Islam, Quran and Hadith? What relations tie the first Muslims, the men of power and knowledge in particular, to the Prophet? What trust can be had in the Islamic sources 
that are so abundant and at the same time so contradictory between themselves, so full of improb improbabilities and often so apparently apologetic and or ideological. How do we integrate the non-Islamic sources that are contemporary of the origins of Islam and of the Arab conquests and that are as equally biased in the study of the beginnings of Islam? Among the authors of the most decisive studies about the apocalyptic dimension of the Quran and of the Hadith, as well of the prophet of the figure of Muhammad, let us mention Snukhor Gronje, Al Kazanova, Tor Andrei, Patrick Krohn and Michael Cook in Hagarism, David Cook, and recently Stephen Schumacher. Each one of these studies has set off a great deal of learned reactions, either admirative or critical, and sometimes even violently hostile. And if the author of these lines lists them, this does not in no way mean that he is in full agreement with the totality of the reproaches or hypotheses. However, the least one can say is that these researchers, founded on erudition as deep, as it is pertinent and on solid philological and historical methods, have undeniably renewed the scientific de <coughs> debates on the origin of Islam by marking them in an enduring way, although some of them have been unjustly neglected for a long time. It is in that sense that the present lecture sees itself as a humble attempt to somehow extend and complete the issues examined by them. Let us go back briefly to the heavy scholars. I will therefore here only mention a few significant examples. There is first of all the hadith of the two fingers. According to Musnad of Ibn Hanbal, the Prophet is said to have declared, declared, the hour is coming. My coming and the hour are separated from one another like this two. And he showed his index and his middle finger. Ibn Sa'ad reports in his Tabarat that Muhammad had been sent at the same time at the hour in order to warn his people of the coming of the painful chastisement. Kazanova cites another prophetic hadith according to the Khitat of al-Maghrizi, my coming and that of the hour are concomitant. The latter even almost came before me. Another time according to the Musnad of al-Hamad, Muhammad is said to have been met mission at the moment of the coming of the hour. The same scholar and his contemporary, the great traditionist Ibn Abi Shayba, report a prophetic tradition where Muhammad declared, those who see me or listen to my word will see a Dajjal, the Islamic Antichrist, during their lifetime. Muhammad is very often called the prophet of the end times, Nabi Akhir al-Zaman, or also the prophet or the messenger of the calamities of the end of world, Rasul al malhama What matters here for our purpose is that the Surah and Quranic passages, the Hadith and narration that we have examined, most likely all go back to Muhammad himself, his immediate entourage, or to a period shortly after him. Given that the coming of the hour has finally not taken place, at that the world has not yet entered, what scholars or ulterior Muslim currents had in their interest to fabricate this type of text by attributing, attributing them to Muhammad, who would have in this way lost all credibility and all prophetic legitimacy. That is the central argument of Casanova, and more recently that of Shoemaker, in order to support the thesis according to which the announcement of the end times constituted the main messages of Muhammad, Muhammad and mission, a message that the Muslim authorities had all interest in concealing. I shall go back to this. Another capital historical element corroborating that thesis is that the period and the part of the world that saw the birth of Muhammad and his message are strongly marked by intense apocalyptic expectation illustrated in all the religious traditions. The never-ending and bloody wars between the Byzantines and the Sasanians, and to a lesser degree the violent conflicts causing bloodshed from Ethiopia to Yemen, with their lot of massacres, destructions, population di displacement and disease, making the defeated of yesterday the victors of tomorrow, all of this created a world replete with uncertainty and anxiety. The messianic uprisings are frequent, especially among the Jews, seeking to liberate Jerusalem from Byzantine domination and to rebuild the temple. Apocalyptic Jewish writings such as the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel or the secrets of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai have had a great deal of religious influence among certain Jews who impatiently expected the deliverance of Jerusalem and who, after the coming of Muhammad, 
would have considered the latter as the providential instrument of that liberation. Apocalyptic beliefs were also present among Zoroastrian Sasanian circles of that time, as it appears throughout texts such as Zandil Ahmed Yas, who proceeds dating, dating poses problem, the Jamas Nomad, or the history of the Armenian Severus. But the most numerous sources of that kind have been composed by Christian authors, especially in Syria, some of them dating a few years after the Arab conquest of the, and therefore set off by them. The Testament of Twelve Apostles, the Apocalypse of Pseudo Methodus, the Apocalypse of Bahira, the Apocalypse of Pseudo Estros, the Sermon on the End Times of Pseudo Ephraim, the Apocalypse of Pseudo Athanasius, etc., etc. The emergence of a new prophet among the Arabs, the sudden conquest of the latter inside the two greatest empires of the region and the civil wars opposing the followers of Muhammad between themselves constitute a non-negligible part of the apocalypse written down or developed after the coming of the prophet. The Quranic apocalyptic belongs in a certain way to that rich literature that was widespread during the, its period. Contrary to what later Muslim apologetics will maintain, pre-Islamic Arabia was not that of the era of ignorance, al jahiliyyah and idolatry, nor was Islam the beginning of Arab monotheism. Probably idolatry no longer existed there for many centuries, except among a few sedentary Bedouins, non-sedentary Bedouins. Apart from numerous epigraphic, archaeologic, and historical proofs, especially outside of the Hejaz, as the numerous studies by scholars like Frédéric Ambert, Christian Robin, or Jan Retzou have proven, the most evident textual confirmation are found in the Quran itself, the massive presence of figures of ancient and new testaments, the allusive character of biblical narratives that demonstrate that the audience knew them, well otherwise these allusions would have remained completely unintelligible, the onomastic of the biblical characters derived from those of Oriental Christianities of syro palestinian culture, of Hebrew. Aramean and Syriac technical terms as important as Quran, Surah, Ayah, Zakat, Salat, Hajj, Umrah, the role of Ethiopian Christianity, etc. The phenomenon has been largely studied by many specialists of various disciplines throughout hundreds of, of works, by the synthesis of which is yet to be undertaken. And Muhammad himself, what was the religious environment of his birth and his education? From which religious traditions did his spirituality drew its sources from? What origin are the many characters and biblical or parabiblical periscopes of the Quran whose occurrences can be counted by the hundreds? For almost a century and a half, many questions, theories, and this have developed around the subject and there again through innumerable works without being able to draw definite conclusions. One or many forms of Judaism, different Christians current such as non nician and non chalcedonian that is mainly non-Trinitarian, Nestorianism, Arianism, Monarchianism, Montalism, heterodox tendencies within many cases. One could also think of a syncretism between these religious traditions. Of course, there is no question of going into a detailed discussion on this subject, one that would lead us astray from what our purpose. Nevertheless, the most probable hypothesis seems to be the one formulated by Alfred Louis de Prémard as a more or less definite belonging of Muhammad to one or the other sectarian grouping qualified as Judeo-Christian. The hypothesis is that at the beginning of the 7th century there existed, if not Arab translation, of entire biblical books, at least ontologies in Arabic of quotes from the Bible or other parallel texts of Jewish or Christian apocalyptic texts. It is true that the term Judeo-Christian remains ambiguous, if not vague. Historically speaking, non-Trinitarian Judeo-Christian sects would, would have disappeared as such around the 4th and 5th centuries of the Common Era. However, a great number of doctrines seems to have survived in a nebula, as is often the case under the name of Ebionites, or Nazarians, maybe the Nasara of the Quran in particular on the margins of the Byzantine Empire in general, and in particular among the Arabic-speaking peoples from Syria to Egypt, including Arabia and Yemen. The Abionites or Nazarenes are therefore Messianic Jews who have kept their Jewish beliefs and practice, but believe in Jesus as Christ and Messiah. 
A great number of researchers since the second half of the 19th century have studied the question with minutiae. Simon Mimouni goes even to the point of declaring Elionit and El Kassite groups, Aramaic speaking, have lived on long after the birth of Islam, at least until the 8th century. One of them, the Elionit, has probably dissolved into the new religion to the point of where we should not ask ourselves if it has not to some extent participated in its birth. The transmission, including the textual one, has been operated mainly through different East Syrian and Mesopotamian Diophysist Christian and or West Syrian, Egyptian and Ethiopian Miaphysist scholars. Be as it may a great number of the doctrines and religious practice that the Christian theologians and heresiographers like Irenus in his Contra Thereses, or Origen in his Contra Celsum, attribute to these Ebionites and Nazareans, those who call themselves Christians yet wish to live according to Jewish law, have a massive presence in the message of Muhammad a strict monotheism that refuses the divinity of Jesus, but that considers him to be the Christ and the Messiah. Both words are said Masih in Arabic, liturgy and night. They believe in the imminence of the end of war and the coming of, the ju of judgment day. Regular prayer, fasting, alms, and the practice of charity. The centrality of ritual purity. The practice of circumcision, circumcision and the prohibition of the conception of pork and even wine. We find all of this in the message of Muhammad. So what about the coming of the Messiah? Indeed, if Muhammad and his message came from a monotheism of Judeo-Christian sensibility, and they were intended for an audience that belonged to the same environment, and if they announced the end of the world, all this being largely attested in the Quran and the Hadith, as we have just seen, then the Prophet could not have not spoken of the central figure of Jewish and Christian apocalyptic and messianism, that is the Messiah. The Quran does not say anything on the announcement down by Muhammad of the imminent coming of the Messiah. However, the non-Islamic works that are contemporary of the Arab Prophet mention the fact. For example, in the Doctrina Jacobi, as old, also known as the Daskali of Jack, Jacob, a Christian work written in Greek, probably shortly before 640. A certain Abraham, the Jew of Caesarea, addresses thusly his brother Justus, the source of Jacob, the, uh, the author of this work. I quote, A prophet has appeared with the Saracens, i.e. Arabs, proclaiming the coming of the awaited Christ, the Messiah. Once in Sikamin, I went to an old man versed in the scriptures and asked him, What can you tell me concerning the prophet who appeared among the Saracens. He replied, he is false one. Prophet, do not come with a saber and a war chariot. End of quotation. Likewise, in the Jewish work already mentioned, the secrets of Rabbi Shim on the Yohai, reference is made to an apocalypse of the beginning of the seventh century, where it is said that for certain Jews, Muhammad was considered as a liberator of Jerusalem and an announcer of the Messiah. Indeed, many textual confirmations prove that for the first followers of Muhammad, and probably for himself, the Messiah of the end times was none other than Jesus Christ. First of all, the Quranic corpus indicates very clearly this on many occasions. Among those occurrence, we use the expression, the Messiah Jesus, and Messiah Isa. In his letter to John the Stylite, the Stylite James of Edessa writes, the Mahgraye, most probably an Aramaic transliteration of Muhajirun, a name along with the Mu'minun that designates the first followers of Muhammad. <laughs> the Mahgraye all confess firmly that Jesus is the true Messiah that was supposed to come and that had been predicted by the prophets. On this point, there is no dispute with us Christians. A great number of studies is consecrated to the identification of the Messiah, Savior of the end times, with Jesus Christ by the followers of the prophet during the first times of Islam. It is most likely the reason why Muhammad would not have presented himself as the Messiah. On the other hand, we would have been considered, at least by some of his followers, as the paraclete. The most renowned textual confirmation is the famous passages of Ibn Ishaq and Hisham in Asirat al nabawiya where finds an echo of verses 4 to 16 and 1523 of the Gospel of John. I quote, 
And when the Munhamanda shall come, the one God shall send us on behalf of the law, as well as the spirit of holiness, who have us. The one who comes out from his Lord, he shall be a witness for me, as we as, as you as we well as you because you are with me since the ancient times. I tell you so that you may not no doubt. The Munhamanna in Syriac is Muhammad in Arabic, and the Paraclet in Greek, Al Baraclitus. What does Paraclet mean? We do not exactly know given that the meanings, the exegesis, and the concept that accompanied its mention in the Johannish writings, the only ones in the New Testament, especially in Christian literature, as expected, are mentioned and varied. In his article, Who is the Other Paraclete? Jan van der Riet offers a dense and documented synthesis of the different meanings of the term. The one who comforts, counselor, intercessor, advocate, assistant, help, resurrector, reviver, and finally, herald, announcer. Often identified to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus Christ himself, or to his spiritual reality, the paraclete in his different functions is a force, a spiritual angelic or divine entity who descends on the saint in order to identify with him and to make him a prophet, a messenger from above. Among these different meanings, the last one is particularly pertinent to our purpose, the herald announcing the coming of the Messiah. Transposed in Manichaean soteriology, the notion takes on the meaning of a spiritual entity that guides souls of the faithful toward the good. This meaning calls two Johannic texts. Thus, in the Judeo-Christian Messianic context, the, lead, the, tit, the title of Paraclete attributed to Muhammad would have been the announcer of the parousia, the advent of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But where things get even more complex is that according to a great number of textual proof, for a certain number of these followers, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the locus of manifestation of Jesus, and thus the second Messiah. Addressing Ali, the Prophet declared, something about you resembled Jesus, the son of Mary. And if I did not fear that certain groups of my community would say about you what the Christians have said about Jesus, I would reveal something about you that would have made the people pick up the dust of your footsteps in order to seek blessings from it. From it. This tradition, underlining the theological similitude between Jesus and Ali, is reported by al Khulaini, one of the most recognized authorities of so-called moderate 12 or Shi'i hadiths. Nevertheless, the association between the two characters reaches its peak in certain sources pertaining to the esoteric Shi'i circle, labeled a posteriori and by the adversaries as botanism, belief in the absolute superiority of the esoteric dimension of faith over the exoteric dimensions, and as extremism, although this circles take the roots deep into the beginning of Islam in the entourage of the Imams Muhammad al babri and Ja'far al-Sadiq, and the, at the edge of the first and second Hijri centuries maybe even in the entourage of Ali, and hence possibly during the time of Muhammad himself. That is why the more or less later texts that transmit the, tradi the traditions that interest us often get them from often very old reports corroborated incidentally by information given by heresiographical works on the first Shi circles of the esoteric and Gnostic type and the great Ali heresiarchs. I quote, people, says Ali, I am the Christ and Al-Masih, I who heal the blind and the leper, who creates birds and chases the clouds, I am the Christ and he is me, Jesus son of Mary is part of me and I am part of him, he is the greater word of God, Ali is not a reincarnation of Jesus, his identification with the son of Mary is explained in ancient Shiism through the doctrine of the transmission of the sacred deposit, al wasiyah of the light of divine aliens or friendship, Nur al walay of the divine spark, Jos al or of the metamphotosis, the movement of life, Tanasuh. It is the passage, the inherence of a luminous divine, divine force in the members of a long chain of initiated saints making them inspired ones capable of communicating with God in order to transmit to mankind 
the messages from above, and even, in certain cases, transforming them in the locus of manifestation of God, Mazhar, Majla. The doctrine that, on many points, reminds of the one of the paraclet as we have just seen. The messianic nature of Ali, a savior, resurrector, and judge of the end of time, is clearly illustrated with many utterances of some sermons, khutbah, attributed to him, where an eternal guide, speaking through the mouth of the historical Ali, declares, loud and clear, his telephonic reality. He said, I am the retributor on the day of retribution, I am the judge of the garden and the fire. I am the first Noah. I am the instigator of the second flood. I am the power of the dirt deniers. I am the call that awakes the inhabitants of the graves. I am the Lord on the day of resurrection. I am the one who shall fill the earth with justice and equity in the same way as it was filled before with oppression and injustice. I am the concealed one, the awaited one for the mighty affair. I am the attendant of the resurrection and the al al-qiyam. I am the attendant of the hour. I am the creator. I am the created one and al-khaliq and al-makhluq. I am the resurrector of the dead. I am the one who spoke through the mouth of Jesus. I am the savior of this time, and the Mahdi al I am the Christ. I am the second Christ, and the Messiah al I am the Jesus of this age, and the Isa has a zaman. I am the Lord of the balance. I am the compassionate one, and the merciful. I am the elevated one, the most elevated one. And the Rahman, and the Rahim, and the Ali al -Adam. Thus, if we consider that the ancient expression, Walayat Ali, Divine aliens, practically in the biblical sense of the term aliens, of Ali may have had the meaning of theophanic nature and messianic mission of Ali. This would cast a new light on a great number of traditions articulating the prophetic mission of Muhammad and the apocalyptic and messianic one of Ali. Ali is a miraculous sign of God for Muhammad. The latter only but called the people on the walaya of Ali. The angel Gabriel came to me, the prophet would have said, and told me, Muhammad, your Lord orders you to love of Ali and the proclamation of his walay. In other words, Muhammad, the prophet warner of the end of the world, only but calls his people, his people on to the guidance of its Messiah, Ali. <clears throat> A conclusion. Like in other religions with apocalyptic proclamation, here as well, the problems start when the end of the world does not occur. When the warned prophet, as well as the awaited Messiah, die without the times reaching the end. Furthermore, regarding the new Arab religion, other facts have rendered things even more complex. Unending civil wars, sudden conquest, the rapid constitution of an immense empire, and the establishment of a strong and more or less centralized state as it happens, that of the Umayyad. And then, a well-established state never went well together with messianism and apocalyptic aspirations. The sum of these factors have had inevitable consequences. The rewriting of history, the reinterpretation of tradition, the bending of the text for the sake of the setting up of a new collective memory. The rewriting of history and the forging of a new collective memory started right at the start of the Caliphate of the Umayyad, perhaps even earlier. Historical enemies of the Banu Hashim in general and the Alids in particular, at least since the Battle of Badr. The public cursing of Ali from the church of the mosque was, but also the propaganda of the state apparatus becomes systematic since the reign of Muawiyah I, the first Umayyad Caliph. The hatred of Ali, his family, that of course that of the Prophet and of his partisans reached its peaks in Karbala and the massacre of Hussein ibn Ali, the grandson of the Prophet and almost all his close one to order of the Caliph Yazid I in 61 of Hijrah, 680. An official version of the Quran established according to the demands of the Caliph of power, most probably the Abdul Malik's one, is elaborated and re released in the great cities of the empire. At the same time, the other recension of the Quran are sought after and destroyed. Likewise, the initiative of the constitution of an official corpus of hadith of the same nature is undertaken mostly in the entourage of Abdul Malik and the court scholar Ibn Shihab al-Zuhr. 
Being the clever politician he was, Muawiyah based in Syria, a largely Christian country, had adopted a strongly pro-Christian attitude and policy. Nevertheless, without any reference to the Quran, nor to Muhammad or Jesus, nor to any other prophet, recovering by the same token the Judeo-Christian tendency of the message of Muhammad and of, of his first followers, while attempting to conceal the messianic dimension of the latter, largely maintained in Alitsal circles. That is most probably the reason why he is without question the heavily incensed hero of most Syria chronicles of the period that, in order to probably go in the direction of Muhammad, Umayyad propaganda, remove Ali from the list of Arab kings after Muhammad. With Abdul Malik, yet again, the process of dead messianization becomes decisive. It must be said again that a strong and well-established state has never loved the apocalypse, the messianism, and the prospect of an approaching end to the world. The figure of Muhammad as the holiest and last of the prof of prophets is rehabilitated and at the same time his message, originally universalistic, gathering the other monotheists called faith food, Mu'minun, is now strongly Arabized. Arabized. It differences and soon its superiority in relation to Judaism and Christianity valorized, and his followers called Muslims, Muslimun. The supreme symbol of the inspiration of a new Arab religion are on the one hand the construction of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, the officialization of an caliphal Quran known as the Vulgate of Osman, now declared independent of Jewish and Christian scriptures, and as the Book of the Muslim, and on the other hand, the sacralization of Arab cities of Mecca and Medina. In this process of dead messianization, there would have been the suppression of the Quranic passages referring to the Messiah Savior, especially if this Messiah was Jesus, and some identified Ali with the second Jesus. Jesus becomes a prophet who is almost identical to the other ones in the Quran, which in the words of Alfred Louis de Primat, had been from beginning to end controlled by the Umayyad family, from Osman to Abdul Malik, Waya Muawiyah and Marwan. Two other Umayyad personalities have also played the role of the highest order of importance in establishing the official Quran. The two already mentioned famous governors of Iraq, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, known as Ibn Ziyad, and Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. The common denominator between all these high-profile historical characters is their implacable hatred against Ali and the Alis. Ibn Ziyad was even directly involved in the massacre of Karbala. Therefore, the thesis of Tahrif, or the falsified Quran, largely maintained among the Shia circles until the 4th, 10th century, and according to which the power of style to Ali and the family of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt had removed from the original Quran all mention of them gains in plausibility. These are my hypotheses about the causes of the problematic character of the Quran. These causes are religious and historical. The highly apocalyptic and messianic dimension of Muhammad's message, the announcement of the coming of Jesus as the Messiah, the savior of the end times, the identification of Jesus with Ali in some circles among the followers of Muhammad. Devotion to Ali and his family, all this creates the conditions for the initiation of a long series of civil wars, almost all of which concern the caliphate power, Umayyad, or Abbasid, and the Ali. A major factor has intensified this process, this process, the rapid formation of an empire, and the need for Islamic power to shift its own religion, independent, even superior to its parents i.e. Judaism and Christianity or Judeo-Christianity. The elaboration of the scriptures, in the, this case the Quran and the Hadith, is a major issue in this history of power. In the face of the formation of a religion in this part of the world, the scripture is a factor of legitimacy of the highest importance. The factions at war with one another each had a different Quranic recension at their disposal. The Alids claim to have the recension of Ali the only complete version of the Quran, containing the account of the events of Muhammad's life, as well as the names of his contemporaries. The enemies of Muhammad in power had censored all this and removed from the Quran all the mentions of the Messiah, suppressions and alterations which gave the Caliphate Quran its disjointed appearance. Of course, Shi'i data are as oriented as other data reported by all the sources over this period. They have no guarantee of historicity 
but curiously they bring their answers to orientalist questions about the style of the Quran, the absence of the contemporaries of Muhammad, or the absence of the figure of the Messiah Savior in the Quran. The rewriting of history, the making of a new memory because of civil wars and the birth of an empire, the will to forget the original messianic and apocalyptic message of Muhammad, and in all this, the central importance of the figure of Ali and his supporters seem to constitute promising directions of research to study the problematic nature of the Quran. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very, very much indeed. This is most eloquent and most interesting. Um, and I'm particularly inspired because I disagree with almost everything that, <laughs> that the speaker um, uh, concluded from the from the, the the nature of the problem as you as you as you sketched it in the beginning. But I think all of you are much more interesting. Uh, to, uh, to our distinguished guests than my own points of view. So please, it's now over to you for questions and answers. And uh, Professor Amir Marzi has kindly agreed to answer questions for the next 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And after which you're all cordially invited to a small reception. Answer. Please. Everything was absolutely clear. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you very much for this lecture. I, I, um, I'm not an early Islamicist. I have some interest in the later uh, period, uh, especially with the Safavid uh, period. Uh, so my question goes to this very intriguing issue of Takrif uh, in the Shi'i polemics. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more what the research on this issue. I mean, I, I've always had trouble finding literature on this issue uh, uh, that, that talks specifically about what is um, you know, sort of the, in the historical perspective, this issue of Tahrir from the Shia side, how it has fared, and whether there is any sort of, um, what, what do you find uh, that is important from the research that's been done on this issue? What, is it helpful for this reconstruction of the early history of the Quran, on the one hand? And the second is the sort of really the historical trajectory of this trope. Do you see sort of this trope uh, um, ebbing and uh, sort of Re reappearing in the Shia polemics as the time goes by. I, I sort of have a sense that in the more recent uh, Shia history, it has been used in the Iran in, since the 70s. I've done some research on that. But I'm wondering, in the Safavid period, especially after Shah Takmaz proclaimed himself as a reincarnation of, of Jesus and Ali, um, whether it, there is a sort of an upsurge, is there a new perspective that some of these polemical works bring into the discussion? Just to sort of these two, so, so how helpful is it for the reconstruction of the history of the early Quran, and then how, uh, in the historical perspective, this notion of taqif in the Shia polemics has May I, just before you start, uh, just to tell everyone that uh, uh, Professor Amir Moazzi would rather respond in French. The Institut Francais, to whom we are extremely grateful, uh, have been kind enough to provide us with uh, simultaneous, uh, or almost simultaneous, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, oui. If you don't want to answer the question in French, because um, it's easier for me. <laughs> uh, la, 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 la thèse de, de la falsification du Coran est extrêmement ancienne dans le Chine. So, uh, the falsification thesis in the, uh, of the Coran is very ancient. C'est-à-dire que nous avons des, des, des évidences textuelles euh, qui remontent au deuxième siècle, au troisième siècle de l'Égypte. J'ai moi-même édité avec mon ami Ethan Kohlberg, de, Ethan Kohlberg de l'Université hébraïque de Jérusalem, euh, le plus ancien texte qui existe sur la falsification de, de le Sayeri, professeur Aziz Lasmé, a parlé de ça. Euh, C'est une monographie sur la question de la falsification qui, qui a été écrite vers 250 de l'Égypte. Uh, I had the, the, the honor to edit uh, the most ancient uh, text with uh, professor Ethan Colbert at the Jerusalem University, uh, which uh, this text is a, is a monograph uh, about uh, sources that, go back, that were written in, the, in 250. 
Alors, c'était et puis les chiites ont soutenu la thèse de la falsification jusqu'au 4e siècle. 4e siècle de Euh the Shias have uh, known of the uh, have uh, retraced the falsification uh, three, uh, theory until the 4th century. Alors, à partir du 4e siècle, la une majorité de chiites vont abandonner la thèse de la falsification. After the fourth century, uh, a majority of the Shias will abandon this theory of falsification. Et ils vont adopter la thèse universelle, n'est-ce pas, d'accepter le, le Coran dit de Rosman. They will accept the, the majority uh, opinion about the, the, yes. the version of the Quran. <coughs> Pour une raison politique, c'est que les chiites sont au pouvoir. It was, uh, for a that they were, uh, in power. Et que la majorité de la population est sunnite, et que le Coran est, constitue la colonne vertébrale de l'islam, et donc les chiites adoptent la position sunnite et ont recours à une sorte d'autocensure. Uh, Well, the core of, of uh, the, well, the, yeah, the spinal cord, spinal cord of, of, uh, uh, of the state, the Shias will accept the majority opinion or views of the Sunnit majority. Mais, mais la thèse de la falsification va rester présente dans le chiisme jusqu'à jusqu maintenant, mais de manière cachée, de manière souterraine. But this falsification thesis will be still present in the... Uh, Uh, in the Shia views uh, until today, but in a more uh, hidden way. Alors, à partir de l'époque safavide, les chiites sont encore au pouvoir, donc le clergé officiel va refuser la thèse de la falsification, mais à côté du clergé officiel, il y a toujours des penseurs qui vont défendre la thèse de la falsification. Mm. C'est une thèse qui est, qui est bon, bien sûr, parce que si vous voulez, nous avons des textes chiites qui font autorité et qui sont acceptés par les chiites et qui parlent de la falsification. Donc, les chiites sur la falsification sont en contradiction avec eux-mêmes. So, this uh, question, this thesis, is a, a source of um, ambivalence uh, within the Shia uh, debate or polemics because they, they were uh, contradicted with themselves because some because they uh, were arguing for and against it. Alors, pour, pour illustrer ce que je dit, je vais donner un, un exemple qui est, qui est, qui est significatif. Uh, for illustration, I will give an example. C'est le cas de Khomeini, de l'Aïtala Khomeini. Lorsqu'il était dans l'opposition en Irak, dans les années 60, 1960, dans un de ses livres, il soutient la thèse de la falsification. Dans un de ses livres, il, il in soutient his, la thèse. In one of his books, he was supporting the thesis of falsification. Lorsqu'il arrive au pouvoir après la victoire de la révolution, when he came to power uh, after the revolution, et qu'on réédite ce livre, and this book was uh, 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 reissued. Yeah. Il, il demande qu'on qu supprime ce passage on censure ce passage sur la falsification. Parce qu'il veut prendre la tête de la révolution islamique avec les sunnites. Ça montre bien la position des chiites. So this, uh, shows well the, the position of the Shia. Est-ce que j'ai répondu <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you very much. No, no, no. You come after, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I find the, the hypothesis you are making problematic for two reasons, uh, especially from a scholar viewpoint. First, the problem of the history of the Quran is still not even settled yet. 
So the assumption of another Quran, you know, it's kind of an empty signifier. Like, where is this other Quran? How can we study it from a historical and scholarly viewpoint? So in that sense, on the other hand, it's uh, the argument is based on the assumptions that the Quran plays the role within the Islamic kind of uh, society and development as much as the Bible, which is not necessarily true comparison in my mind. And some religious studies scholar will attest to that. That the Quran even more more closer to the figure of the Jesus of the Messiah than and the Hadith is closer to the nature of the Bible as stories and you know as a more uh, narrative style. So in that sense, and instead of assuming an esoteric uh, assumptions or hypothesis to explain the problematic with the Quran, wouldn't be similar hypothesis like linguistic comparing with Arabic poetry or or the cultural. Of course, the influence of the Judeo Christian is cannot be denied, but also the very environment from which Muhammad brought his message. So that is my question. I hope it's clear. Compris la première partie sur la, la, la deuxième partie. La deuxième partie. Le Le milieu de. de, de, de oui. euh, je crois que vous avez dit la, la, la première question, c'est euh, où, où est-ce qu'on peut trouver les autres Corans, c'est ça? So the first part of your question was, where can you find the, the, the other Qur'an? So yeah, it's, it's is it a necessary hypothesis? It's a hypothesis. Is, is, is it a necessary hypothesis, if I may reformulate the question? Yes. Is the hypothesis necessary? Uh, on peut poser la question au sujet du Qur'an officiel. Uh, we can ask this question uh, with regards to the official Qur'an. C'est-à-dire que pendant les trois premiers siècles, euh, il n'y a aucun manuscrit du Coran complet. Les, 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 premiers, les plus anciens manuscrits complets du Coran, tel qu'il apparaît, datent du 3e, vers la fin du 3e siècle. Ça, ça date de l'époque abbasside. So, uh, in the first three centuries, uh, there are no complete manuscripts that we know of of the Coran. The, the first known manuscript is from the end of the third. Alors, sur les autres Corans, bien sûr, nous n'avons aucun, aucun manuscrit du, du, de, de, des autres Corans, mais nous avons des citations. Aussi bien dans les sources chiites que dans les sources sunnites. In, uh, both the Shia and the Sunnit, uh, sources. Vous savez, le, le Kitab de Masahef, le mm -hmm. Book of Codices, de, de, de Sejistani, c'est un livre sunnite, euh, nous parle d'un compagnon du prophète Obaï, le Kaab, dont le codex, dont la recension coranique, contenait deux sourates, deux sourates, pas des, des versets, deux sourates, qui ne figurent pas dans le Coran actuel. So, uh, in the book of codices, uh, there's a part which refers to uh, two surahs, not verses, but the verses, but surahs of uh, uh, of Another codex? Yes. Well, that are absent from the official Quran. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, beaucoup de sources sunnites nous disent que, par exemple, un autre compagnon du prophète, Ibn Mas'ud, considérait que le, la Fatiha et les deux dernières sourates ne font pas partie du Coran. Et il y a beaucoup qui considéraient que Ibn Mas'ud, compagnon du prophète, He as well considered uh, these passages not to be part of the, the official Quran. The first and the two last surahs of the, of the Quran, that's right, ne sont pas du Quran. Ce sont des prières du prophète. Those are prayers of the prophet. So, ceci montre qu'il y avait des débats. This shows that there has been a debate about this. Okay. Des débats qui ont duré pendant trois siècles. Right. Debate which went on for three uh, centuries. Et puis nous avons dans les sources sunnites aussi des citations de Coran qui, qui n'existe pas dans le Coran. Of the same, uh, same way, in the Sunni sources, we have uh, passages that are not part of the official Coran. Et, et bien sûr, les sources chiites sont les sources qui, qui, qui donnent le plus de citations euh, de ce Coran fantôme, n'est-ce pas C'est-à-dire des citations, par exemple, dans le livre de Sayyari que j'ai édité, nous avons près de 300 euh, citations coraniques Obviously, the Shia sources have much more 
references of, of these phantom Quranic uh, passages. In the book of Salier that the professor uh, edited, uh, they cited more than 300 uh, such quotations. quotations. Alors pour ce qui est le, le, le milieu de, de, de Mohammed, vous savez, nous savons très peu de choses. Parce que euh, les sources islamiques sont, sont difficilement crédibles. Nous ne pouvons pas faire confiance. C'est-à-dire que, si vous voulez, euh, le, le Mohammed historique, à mon avis, est à jamais perdu. On ne connaîtra pas le Mohammed historique. About the, the, the milieu, the, the surroundings of, of Mohammed. Uh, the sources are very unreliable, the Islamic uh, sources. So, uh, in the opinion of the professor, uh, the Muhammad, as the, the, historical, first, the historical Muhammad, uh, is lost for, for good. We will never know about him. When you look at the literature of the Sira, the biography of the Prophet, when you look at the Hadith, the personality of Muhammad is extremely contradictory. Vous avez un Mohammed euh, qui, qui est presque féministe, qui est extrêmement tendre, qui est presque mystique. Presque humaniste, il est très, très, très tendre. Et, et vous avez un Mohammed qui est un torsionnaire, qui est un misogyne, And then there is the other Mohammed, et un chef de guerre, who is a, 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 misogyne. a warlord, a misogynistic warlord, and who extorts people. Ceci a posé problème aux musulmans eux-mêmes. Which was a problem for the for the Muslims. Les, well. les contradictions de la Syrie. Les con so. contradictions, the contradictions of the Syrie. Donc c'est très difficile. À quel milieu Et ce que je viens de dire montre que effectivement, le Coran montre qu'il qu connaissait le milieu judéo-chrétien, puis le chrétien. So the, uh, this is a, the contradiction that I also explained in my, in my uh, uh, presentation. So the, the milieu which we know that he was aware, that he did know the, the judéo-christian uh, culture. Ce qui est, il y a des éléments importants. Euh, L'onomastique coranique. Pourquoi Jésus est appelé dans le Coran Nisa euh, Pourquoi Jésus Onomastique. Les noms dans le Coran aussi représentent la question. Pourquoi Jésus est appelé Nisa Les chrétiens à l'époque, ils disent tous, ils appellent. Jésus, Yassou. So, uh, the Christians uh, of the time called Jesus Yassou. Pourquoi Abraham est appelé Ibrahim? Why is Abraham called Ibrahim? Alors que les chrétiens à l'époque, ils appellent Abraham. When the Christians of the time called him Abraham. Ce sont les appellations historiennes. En syriac. These are syriac historian uh, denominations. Ça, ça a un sens. Et, et c'est la même chose pour les autres. Hein, pour les autres appellation des, 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 des prophètes. Et pourquoi cette insistance sur, le, le, sur le, les, les prophètes bibliques Pourquoi le prophète dit « Moi, je suis un continuateur de, de, de Moïse et de Jésus » Pourquoi les mots clés sont en syriac Oran est en syriac. Soura est syriac. Aya est syriac. Hajj est syriac, Omra est hébreu. Donc, ce sont des mots, Zakat, Salat, ce sont des mots clés. Donc, ça, ça donne une idée. Ça donne une... Ce qui montre que, si vous voulez, euh, donc, le milieu arabo-arabe de Mohammed est problématique. So this, uh, the, the surrounding, the Arab, Arab? Yes, yeah, it's purely Arabic. The, the, the Arabic of the Prophet is problematic itself. Ce sont des questions. Uh, these, are, these are questions that 
Et, 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 les, et les sources musulmanes ne nous apportent pas de réponses. Thank you very much for your lecture, Professor. Um, I'm very much interested in this apocalyptic image that you mentioned as part of the origins of Islam. As you mentioned, uh, once the empire is established and institutionalized, they get eventually tuned down very much as Christianity with the key differentiation that uh, Islam is expanded through military action while Christianity is establishing an already institutionalized empire. Uh, I'm not that well informed into the origins of Islam, I know some things, but I once heard this lecture by Paul Friedman, this professor in jail, in which he argued that although religion was a motivation for expansion, the conversion of the population was not necessarily, which somehow would seem to contradict the apocalyptic image of repent, convert, the judgment is come. With that in mind, I would like to ask you which, which was the role of these apocalyptic images in the military expansion of Islam. Uh, je pense que ça n'avait pas de rôle. I think that it didn't have any role. Quand vous regardez, c'est-à-dire que les, on ne sait même pas si l'expansion de l'islam et, et, et les, les premières armées musulmanes avaient des motivations religieuses. Ce n'est pas sûr. We don't even know whether the, the first uh, quand vous le dites, même parfois, c'est-à-dire nous avons des, des, des textes qui nous disent que parfois les populations voulaient se convertir à l'islam et les, les, les chefs des armées omeyyades les ont empêchés. Sometimes the population wanted to convert to Islam, but the, uh, their uh, leaders uh, no prohibited them. Mm -hmm. Quand vous regardez les, les, les premières Omeyyades, c'est-à-dire moi ou hier, c'est très le texte, les rares textes que nous avons de cette époque, il n'y a aucune mention ni de Allah ni de Muhammad. Aucune. Okay. Yeah. Oui. Uh, if you're looking at the, at the, the, the yeah. Omeyyad, first Omeyyad, nous avons des textes aussi qui nous disent que, par exemple, pour les premiers théoriciens omeyyades, le calife est supérieur au prophète. Parce que le, le prophète apporte le message de Dieu, mais c'est au calife de les appliquer. Donc, voyez, il y a beaucoup de questions. La, la, les débuts de l'islam sont extrêmement énigmatiques. Ce que, ce que, tout ce que je veux dire, c'est ça. C'est-à-dire que nous avons beaucoup plus de questions au sujet des premiers temps de l'islam que des réponses. So there are so many questions, and which is, this is what I want to say, that the, the beginning of the Islam is very enigmatic. There are too many questions, and uh, there are not, not enough answers. Et, et, et le Coran fait partie de ces enigmes. And the Quran is one of these enigmas. Sorry. Please. Yes. And then you. You first. You go first. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have one question from a perspective that I'm particularly interested in, and that is the comparative study of uh, religions and the comparison of uh, critical approaches in religious studies. Your deconstruction of the historical Muhammad resembles a lot the deconstruction of the historical Jesus at the beginning of the 20th century, when Jesus was identified as a prophet of the imminent uh, end of the world, and the history of the Gospels was seen in the light of a writing out this expectation from, from the text. So there is, uh, uh, my question would be, how far could uh, critical strategies from one text be applied to the other? And in how far is there a pitfall in uh, supposing that there might be parallels and in uh, uh, exporting uh, uh, critical approaches from the Gospels to the Quran? La comparaison a des limites. 
Mais euh, il y a énormément de parallèles, je pense, entre les débuts du christianisme et les débuts de l'islam. Comparison uh, has its limits, but I, uh, the professor thinks that uh, there are many parallels uh, as, uh, regarding the beginning of Islam and regarding uh, the beginning of Christianity. C'est-à-dire la dimension messianique, effectivement, est très présente dans, dans, dans les couches anciennes des, 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 des évangiles, surtout les évangiles apocryphes. <coughs> Et le fait que c'est surtout avec, apparemment avec Saint Paul que le christianisme veut déclarer sa séparation avec le judaïsme. And it's uh, uh, very apparent how, especially with, the, with Saint Paul, when Christianity wanted to distinguish itself, itself from Judaism. Je ne pense pas, Jésus était juif, n'est-ce pas Et on ne trouve pas, on n'a pas l'impression qu'il veut fonder une nouvelle religion. Jesus was, uh, Jesus. Jewish, uh, was a Jew, so uh, he doesn't give the impression that he was uh, wanting to uh, found a new religion. Et c'est très curieux qu'on trouve le raisonnement de Saint Paul dans le Coran. C'est-à-dire que euh, Saint Paul saute par-dessus le judaïsme pour arriver à Abraham. Il dit la religion de Jésus, c'est la religion d'Abraham, c'est-à-dire avant le Judaïsme. Nous, nous trouvons exactement le même raisonnement dans le Coran. N'est-ce pas ce qu'on appelle le, le, le din al-Hanif, n'est-ce pas le, le Hanif, c est, c est, aussi ça pose problème. Mais l'islam fait la même chose, c'est-à-dire il dit l'islam, il saute par-dessus le christianisme et le judaïsme pour dire c'est la religion d'Abraham. There is a, another parallel, uh, as Saint Paul says that he It's as if he wants to skip Judaism to say that Jesus' religion is that of Abraham. Uh, the same can be uh, recognized in the Quran when it. Yes. That's a religion. religion that, that, says, religion that uh, is as if it wanted to skip uh, Judaism and Christianism to say that uh, Abraham's religion is the same of the prophet. Et, et le fait que le pouvoir chrétien essaie de, de occulter de cacher la dimension messienne. The, 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 the Christian power, the, the, Christian, as, as the Christian power wanted to uh, somehow conceal this messianic uh, aspect of Christianity. Avec le, le And it was the same with the, the Muslim power. Et, et en fait, pour, pour réécrire l'histoire, n'est-ce pas, réécrire l'histoire, c'est-à-dire ce qu'ont fait les écritures chrétiennes, c'est de, de cacher la judaïté du Christ. Le judaïté, le judaïsme de, de, de Christ, c'est la même chose. C'est-à-dire que le pouvoir arabe essaie, aurait essayé de cacher pas, le christianisme et le judaïsme de, 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 de Mohammed. Et c'est similaire avec les musulmans qui voulaient cacher Uh, the Judaism and the Christian Christianity uh, or the influences of these uh, on uh, Muhammad. Les premiers fidèles de Muhammad s'appellent les Mu'minun. C'est dans les textes que... C'est Facebook. First, yeah. okay. So the, the first followers of Muhammad were called, called the faithful. Le mot musulman, enfin, musulman, c'est plus tardif. Probablement, ça date de l'époque de Ahmed Malik. And the, the term Muslim is uh, dated in a much later uh, time, probably around, uh, around the time of Abdel Malik. Donc, quand vous dites mon nom, ça peut englober, bien sûr, tous les monétistes. So when Pas you say faithful, the faithful, uh, it might include all the monotheist uh, religion. Um, I hope that Professor Amir Maizzi will bear with us and accept two last questions. And, and Excellency, please. please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question regarding the term that you're using for fortification of Quran, especially from the Shia perspective. Uh, the impression I got from the lecture is that early Shias did believe in the falsification of Quran somehow. 
Uh, and the reason and the logic you gave is because there is a missing text about the reverence regarding Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussain, or all the holy Shia figures. Um, but I wanted to ask, like, how your uh, even if there is some Shia hidden Quran which I never came across in my life being a Shia myself, um, how that negates the mainstream Quran? I mean, okay, there are a few references that maybe they are missing if you go by your assumption, but how? those references negate something in the existing Quran that the Shia state believes that there is something, there is some falsification in the Quran from the Shia theological perspective. <laughs> Quelle différence ça fait que c'est... Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oui. Euh, bah, oui. Ah, non, il n'y a pas un... un enfin, on parle de l'existence d'un Coran chiite, mais il est caché. Et selon la, la croyance chiite, le Coran chiite ne reviendra qu'à qu la fin des temps. Ça, c'est le, avec le, le sauveur que tu essayes. So, There is a, a, a Shia Quran which might be hidden or, or concealed, which will only uh, come about at the end of time. Nous avons seulement des, des, des citations. We only have quotes of this Quran. Des centaines. Hundreds. Hundreds of quotations. Alors, c'est très compliqué parce que quand on parle de la falsification, on parle aussi soit des suppressions, n'est-ce pas? Soit des, a, des ajouts. On parle soit de sorte de ou un déclin. Ok Alors, si vous, si vous dites seulement des passages ont été supprimés, ce qui reste, c'est du Coran. So, if we do not uh, take into consideration the. Uh, if you say the there is only the suppression of the, of the, in, in, the, in, the, in the official Quran. That means the Quran is the word of God. So he has what remains what remain. is the Quran is the word of God. Mais si il y a la thèse des ajouts, But if the thesis, uh, if we take the thesis of uh, additions, là, il n'y a aucune confiance, n'est-ce pas, dans le texte. Then we uh, can't have, can't uh, trust the text. C'est <coughs> pourquoi dans le, dans le chiisme, il y a eu aussi des débats sur cette question-là. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des adeptes de suppression et il y a des adeptes des ajouts aussi. Donc il y a, si vous voulez, il y a cette question-là. Et puis, si, ce qui est, je pense, important, c'est que cette thèse chiite introduit de l'histoire dans la rédaction du Coran. Uh, but what is interesting that this uh, Shia thesis introduces history uh, into the, 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 the corpus. Et ça, c'est un, une révolution. C'est-à-dire que ça relativise les choses, ça contextualise. And that's very, very revolutionary because it... Uh, et je pense ce qui pose problème peut-être pour l'islam c'est que la mentalité musulmane n'a pas, pas encore intégré une vision historique donc c'est une question politique aussi dans le sens noble du terme. So it's a, also a political question in the noble sense of the word. Okay. Merci professeur. Just one maybe naive question. Is it easy for you or even possible to have a dialogue on these topics with the Muslim clerics right now whether they are Shia or Sunnites? No. <laughs> <laughs> Je dois dire, c'est 
les chiites actuels, surtout au pouvoir, bien sûr, n'acceptent pas la, la, la thèse de la falsification. Mais quand même, ils acceptent la discussion. But they accept the discussion, the debate on it. Avec les autorités sunnites, c'est plus difficile. Okay. Thank you all very, very much indeed, and thank you. Thank you.